humanitarian need that is serving a purpose and violating no and violating no rules. So I think it's very difficult. You know, maybe difficult to to unpack. Uh, but the courts that are issuing their reasonings, the, the, the reasoning that is in the patent law, there are you know, there are reason there are there are grounds patent standards for it on, in the one and in the other. There are health grounds of which India has availed itself. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shapiro. And then we'll get to uh, your back. Um, as an economist, the simplest way would be um, to uh, try to hold most things constant. That is, I would look at countries with similar health challenges, similar um, uh, per capita income, with and without the presence of a generic industry, a generic production industry. Um, you would expect that if this is not serving a commercial purpose, that other countries uh, at, of comparable per capita income and comparable um, um, health care challenges would take a similar course. Um, and so that would be one way to evaluate it. You can't prove it, but it'd be one way to evaluate it. Well, as we all know, issues of intent are often difficult to sort out, but uh, uh, sometimes empirical analysis can help us to understand what's really going on. In the back, please. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to pick up on that point. Uh, India has 500 million people without electricity. That's more than the total population of the European Union. So when we talk about what is appropriate in India as a standard of um, managing intellectual property rights for public health, our argument actually is they are failing. They are not doing enough right now. All of Sub-Saharan Africa, basically, with the exception of South Africa and a few other countries, do not have to introduce intellectual property protection until 2021, as I was noting. That would be the comparable standard to me. That's why there was so much criticism from organizations like ours and others when India decided to uh, enter the TRIPS agreement. To pick up on the point that uh, Mr. Maverdoek was saying, most of the generics industry that's able to produce these medicines is in India today. Um, and so basically by issuing licenses, whether in India or other countries, for the use of cheap generic medicines, ends up coming back to Indian producers. What may look like an industrial purpose ultimately is simply a reflection of, of how the industry is structured increasingly. And that's why a lot of the multinational companies are buying up the Indian generics companies or partnering with them, because they're their best uh, sort of source to actually enter a lot of these markets that these uh, companies have managed to penetrate. The last thing I would say is in terms of comparable standards, a lot of countries at a higher level of economic development compared to India, for instance, Thailand and Indonesia and others, have issued compulsory licenses. Um, the real problem, of course, we're facing in these countries, and India is the most extreme example, is inequality. So when 75% of the world's poorest people live in middle-income countries, um, even though it may look from this panel and from a lot of the panelists um, to be uh, an, a source of econo economic opportunity for organizations like ours, which increasingly are working in middle-income countries, it is really where the source of poverty and suffering is today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me go over my 10 minutes. Mr. Uh, Johansson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would also like to thank this, this uh, panel for appearing here today. Uh, I found your, your statements very uh, useful and interesting. Um, my first question is for Mr. Malpani and Mr. Mayvarda. Um, you spoke on the importance of the generics industry in India. While India has a large generic sector, what is the size of India's innovative pharmaceutical se sector? And stepping back, overall, what are the competitive strengths and weaknesses of India's pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies? And anyone else on, on the panel should feel, to, uh, feel free to re respond to this question as well. Thanks. Uh, I can't give you precise answers, which I would give afterwards. But I would notice, uh, note a couple of things that I'll say more as, um, uh, let's say, qualitatively. Uh, the first is that the Indian generic sector is actually changing quite rapidly. So a decade ago, our organization and, and others, including people in this room, could actually go to the companies and encourage them to enter some of these markets. That's a diversion of their resources towards the production of generic medicines. A lot of the companies today are telling us that we're not interested in those markets anymore. We're trying to develop new medicines so that we can enter the U.S. market and others. Um, and, and basically, they feel that the levels of intellectual property protection in India are good enough. So I'm sorry, you're referring to Indian GM companies. companies. Okay. That's right. So that, it's actually become a big concern for organizations like ours that um, when you couple in the pressure that they're feeling from foreign governments, such, uh, such as you know, sort of what's happening today, as well as what they're seeing as commercial opportunities in the future, um, the, the lifeline that we have for millions of patients is actually going to dissolve. 
and that these companies actually are very quickly becoming the innovators. We actually are talking to a lot of uh, Indian generics companies today that have very promising pipelines of new products um, that they are eventually going to sell at very high prices in the United States and other countries. I think the second thing to note is the companies that are here today and others are investing in these companies because they have a lot of innovative capacity in research and development and because a lot of them are actually the, the sources and sites now of uh, clinical research as well as clinical trials. So it's already changing regardless of how we're, we're talking about this today. The concerns we have is that the poorest patients are going to be left behind. Thank you. Would anyone? Yes, Mr. Love. I would, I would echo uh, the idea that poor people are a weak lobby, even in poor countries. I, mean, I think a lot of people here they, they assume that you know the teeming masses are somehow controlling the legislatures in the poor countries. And poor countries are kind of like the United States; they tend to be more focused on the one percent than the ninety-nine percent or the bottom twenty or whatever. So I think that if you look at the the, the facts on the ground and access to cancer drug. My wife is here, she's a stage four cancer patient for uh, breast cancer, she takes her septum. Uh, she's alive and, and, and probably will be for some time because it's a very effective drug. There is basically no women in developing countries that have had access to this drug even though it's been in the market for over a decade. Why is that? It's because these countries, as, as Rohit suggested, they are not really dealing with the intellectual property issues because they think they'll get punished through trade things, with these kind of hearings and stuff like that, all these lobby groups and things like that. They're more interested in developing uh, friendly trade relationships with the United States and Europe and sort of, you know, not being on the 301 list and things like that. So they just kind of basically turn, turn, turn their back on patients and feel they're strategically not really an important part of the economy. So I think that, um, uh, I think that um, in India, um, there's some people in India that would, uh, China has not issued any compulsory licenses on drugs. And uh, partly because they see themselves as a supplier of, uh, of biologic drugs, they're actually become the, a really big uh, filer of patents for years. So I think that, you know, if, if countries like, like, like China and India become kind of focused at, on, on pushing high IP price, uh, norms and prices, um, you know, it, it will have a consequence. Uh, not necessarily given. We have an aging population. Um, and we pay unbelievably high prices for cancer drugs in this country. I don't know if you guys have noticed it or not. But you have to look to the future. And, and, and the pharma industry, which is mostly, it was increasingly foreign owned anyhow, um, uh, imposes costs on U.S. firms that have to compete in, the other, in every other sector. So you want, to, you want to have automobile, aircraft manufacturer, software companies, all that kind of stuff. You're saddling them with a very high cost structure to buy drugs to set a great example so that a poor person in India will accept dying because they don't get access to drug. But I think maybe that's really not in the best interest of the United States, but it's just responsive to the superb lobbying talents of the pharmaceutical industry. All right, thank you, Mr. Love. Thank you, Mr. Malpani, as well. And Mr. Malpani, I just wanted to make one comment just to assure you of something. You say the generic, pharma the generic pharmaceutical industry in India feels pressure from foreign governments like what is happening here today. I want to assure you, what we're here doing here today is simply collecting information. We're not going to make a decision on anything. Uh, the ICC is an independent body. We're not, we don't report, we, we're not run by Congress, we're not run by the administration. We provide information to them. So I want to assure you that is what we're, we're seeking do, to do here today. We're asking some kind of pointed questions maybe, but the purpose is to, is to obtain information to be used by other government entities. I, I respect that, and, and to be clear, I, I don't see your, your panel as, as not having an, art, um, an independent um, quasi-judicial role. Um, but what I can tell you is when a letter is produced to um, convene hearings like this, um, as being someone who also um, travels quite frequently to India and has to work all over the world, I can tell you the way it plays out in the Indian press and amongst the Indian stakeholders is one of great concern. Certainly, I understand that. But just uh, just to assure you that we are not taking a view one way or another. We're simply trying to collect information. Um, and getting back to, to the question I spoke to you on a minute ago, Mr. Malpani, uh, do, you, do you have a breakdown of, of the size of the pharmaceutical industry in India, generics as opposed to innovative? I know it's probably some or both, I assume, but do you, do you have it uh, in your mind or do you have some document which would provide that type of information? Or any other witness as well? I, I would have to, um, I don't, um, but what I can simply say is that the largest companies are the ones that we're seeing evolve very quickly or in, in many cases are, are being bought up by, by foreign manufacturers or being tied into um, relationships. Um, but of course there are thousands of companies in India. The question is which ones can produce complex drugs 
um, that, that actually are needed in, for instance, in our operations. All right, thank you. Um, in getting back to the compulsory license of Mexibar, uh, and Ms. Corcoran, or perhaps Mr. Malpani, or, or Mr. Mayberg might be able to answer this, but the terms of the compulsory license, do you, do you all know what profit uh, NACO re would receive from this? I mean, they're, they're, they're not a, I mean, they're, they, they're, they are a profit entity as well. You know what it would be? You know what the terms of that would be? Yes, Mr. Love. I mean, they're selling it for $27 a week uh, as compared to um, uh, the bear price was, was in India was well over $1,000 a week. So uh, within that $27, they're definitely making a profit. Uh, they're paying a 7% royalty, which amounts to over $7 per patient per, per month in uh, India, which is actually a greater percent. Of, uh, of of their income than than, than than would come out of a patient in the United States was paying fifty thousand dollars for a drug in terms of average royalties in the United States. But uh, my guess is their margins could be around thirty percent, could be something like that. Uh, their ten K report is I mean they're not their ten K the annual reports available. I've looked at it. They're a very profitable company. I would say that Simpla, the other country that sells the generic version of the drug. Uh, is also a very profitable company. And I think the Indian generics, and the generic sector worldwide is a very profitable sector. Their businesses, they're in it for themselves, uh, and they're doing quite well. And I think everyone would be doing poor, quite poorly if they were not doing quite well, because the alternative would be to have just nonprofit organizations producing drug. And I think that the profit-making generic sector has proved to be dynamic, competitive, and they've driven prices down. Thank you. And continuing on this this line, uh, Ms. Corcoran, how long has Bayer been doing business in India? I assume it's a long time. Your, your company's been around a long time. Uh, yes, I'd have to get back to you. I mean, okay. Bayer is a, um, you know, we're a crop science, material science, and a healthcare company. So we've been doing business in India on, on multiple, uh, multiple levels. So I can get back to you on that. And, and, and following up on that, how has Indian government policy changed in recent years with regard to intellectual property and how it impacts uh, your company? I mean, I, I would say as kind of reiterating our submission, I think we all saw, just like a lot of other pharma biopharmaceutical companies, a lot of promise early on with some of their intellectual property laws. But then we saw um, a pretty significant deterioration in terms of you know, patent linkage cases. I mean, I think if you look at our filing, in it, before the issuance of the CL to NACO, we were in litigation with NACO and CIPLA on two patent infringement cases. Um, so our experience has been that the environment has significantly deteriorated and continues to do so on that front. All right, thanks. Thank you. I have another question, but I'm going to try to stick to my time. I know that's been a theme of today, but I might come back with another question for you in a minute after we end my second round. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Robin. Thank you. Uh, continuing on um, with, with the Bayer representative, um, do you have estimates of lost revenue due to the compulsory licensing of Nexavar um, in India? Is this something that could be provided in our survey process? Yes, I could go back and try to um, generate a response to that. Has, has the generic um, version of Nexavar shown up in other developing country markets yet? We have some evidence that the generic version is showing up in other markets. We are also aware, as I think we indicated in our submission, that CIPLA has reached out to Vietnam to provide serafinib to them in the hospital setting. Um, so we are aware of and very concerned about efforts to expand outside of India. Is that contrary to the terms of the compulsory license that we need to assist you in? Yes. The compulsory license covers NACO, but not CIPLA. Uh, um, the, the compulsory license is limited to the territory of India. I will tell you today that independently, we, we should do a decision, my organization, to ask uh, Egypt to uh, uh, file uh, uh, for a compulsory license under Section 92A of the Indian Patent Law to export uh, either from NACO or CIPLA to Egypt so that uh, uh, Nina's father and other friends that they know that have liver cancer in Egypt can get the drug at $27 a week. So 
if we have anything to do with it, those drugs will uh, be made available in other parts of the, of the world. But right now, the compulsory license is, in fact, unfortunately, limited to the to the territory of India. It's not as if, believe me, it's not as if the only people that have liver cancer on the planet live in India. I mean, they live all over the world, and those people that need Nexafar are not getting it. I would just um, like to reiterate, I know there's a lot of focus on the CL, but we're also here because of other significant issues with their patent system, including patent infringement. So these larger contagion issues and policy issues are just as significant as the CL in India, which is why I brought up the issue of CIPLA. Okay. Um, I just have one more question maybe for the record. Um, has uh, patient access to the, the drug Nexafar changed since the compulsory license for that, for that product? I mean, have, have sales increased or decreased? Specifically for Bayer? Yeah. I'd have to get back to you on that. It's not my understanding that sales have gone up. I know we have a patient assistance program that does provide to patients, but that is separate from what would be sales under our patent. I mean, I, I just wonder if your sales have gone down. I would say yes, and I can get back to you specifically with that information. Okay. And then could you talk to me a little bit about your patient access program and how it compares to the generic? It is. Our patient access program is comparable in pricing to the generic version, to NACO's generic version. Uh, uh, roughly. Yes, it's okay. about $500. It's about 10% of the price. It's... Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, really, the price that we're looking at today is twenty-seven dollars a week, out of uh, uh, which I think would go down if there was an open license on it. I think actually twenty-seven dollars a week is higher than it should be, but it's not five hundred dollars uh, a month like she's she's referring to. And when 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 Bear only got engaged when the compulsory license was going on on this, which is a really common story, countries become like sort of interested in access when they're facing a compulsory license. Just like Bayer lowered its price by 50% on silver fox in the United States when Tommy Thompson, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, threatened a compulsory license against Bayer in the United States of America back in 2001. But uh, 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 the, the, the original program they had is you had to pay initially a full month before you got any kind of concessionary price, which was over $5,000 in India. So patients couldn't even they couldn't even buy the first month in order to qualify for the concessionary program. They were, they were selling between 70 and 200 patients for the whole 1.2 billion person country for that drug. It, it didn't even appear. And in fact, in their last annual report, Bayer didn't even mention compulsory licensing okay. in their so annual report as anything that affected the bottom line. All right. Um, just a qu question about how we measure the access that uh, what was the result that this compulsory license resulted in in terms of more patient access to the drug? Is there other numbers on that? From whom? From, 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 the, from, from, from the generic companies, access went way up in India. We can, and we, I'm sure that, uh, that you can have data on that, but, but not from Bayer, but from we'll everybody but we will, we will provide you the data as you requested. I'd also just like to comment, too, um, as I think we made clear in our submission, um, during the court proceedings, they were very clear that they did not consider the fact that there was a generic infringing product on the market or a patient assistance program as part of their calculation in determining the CL. Thank you. That's <laughs> this is for Doctors Without Borders. Um, are there factors other than patents that inhibit your ability to advance public health in developing countries? Yes, but it is directly related back to patents in that the patent system does not innovate on behalf of our patients. Uh, so we face problems with medicines that are not appropriate for our patients. They're not heat stable. They're not available in pediatric formulations or because of the patent system, we can't combine them together to simplify treatment. So for instance, for tuberculosis, which kills a million people a year, uh, in order to provide treatment for some strains of tuberculosis, we ask patients to take 14,000 pills over a two-year period, and even then the treatment success rate is only 40%. We've only had two new tuberculosis drugs that appear in the last 50 years, despite the fact that this is a public health disaster. Pfizer last year sold off its entire anti-infectives division, which means not only are they ignoring the, the burden of tuberculosis, 
They're ignoring antibiotic resistance, which is also killing Americans today and having problems in developed countries. The other problems we have is that um, simply most medicines do not exist. So we heard comments that there are now new malaria products on the market because of the investments of the pharmaceutical industry, but it's actually the exact opposite. Because of organizations like ours and organizations like others in the room that pointed out that the patent system was excluding two billion people around the world from the fruits of innovation, many governments in response to this started to invest in research and development. We now have a situation in that the current R&D system does not provide any innovation for one-sixth of the world's patients, so governments have to subsidize R&D for those patients or the Gates Foundation today. So yes, patents are very much related also to why we cannot deliver medical care. We have diagnostics that are useless in the field that are produced by a lot of the same companies that are in the room uh, because they're simply only appropriate for a hospital that has a constant uh, source of electricity. We have vaccines that require taking four doses that are impossible to provide to people who have to walk 200 miles in order to reach a clinic, or vaccines that cannot remain outside of the cold chain for more than 20 minutes, or they go bad. So we have to somehow get them from a port to a patient in, in a, a very resource poor setting in the middle of an emergency to provide that vaccine. We are, our patients and our organization is excluded from our medical innovation system, and it's because we've decided to use the patent system to develop new products. If we could talk a bit about anything good that multinational corporations have done to increase access to medicines. Well, again, to be clear, because of the subsidies that are emerging from uh, various governments as well as from foundations, companies are starting to make some incremental changes in how they engage in research and development. Um, for HIV and AIDS, thanks to the outcry that emerged in 2000, 2001, many companies, as Mr. Love was noting, are now signing voluntary licenses, which are essentially the same as compulsory licenses to increase access to these drugs and to improve generic competition. But that's because the HIV and AIDS lobby is a powerful one. It includes millions of patients around the world and it includes taxpayers like the United States that are investing in HIV and AIDS treatment. So you see companies signing licenses in order to increase access. But of course you don't have those same lobbies for cancer and for other diseases. You see some companies which are increasing access to their compound libraries to screen for treatments that could be effective against tuberculosis or malaria. But this is occurring in part because others are willing to subsidize that screening and are willing to take those compounds that are identified and drive it through the drug development process. So we acknowledge that companies are doing more to start identifying issues around access and innovation. But the problem we have is that when governments take these measures that are fully legal under the TRIPS agreement in order to provide for public health care, the response can often be quite tough and can be quite damaging to public health. I, I, I just, and there, there is another, another way to think about this, which is that uh, uh, expensive drugs are a disincentive to invest in other types of health care. When, when AIDS drugs were $10,000, nobody wanted to spend money on infrastructure, doctors, training, uh, testing, and things like that. When the, drug, when the price fell, their interest is so Thailand is proposed in the area of cancer. The countries have a, a different deal, that they have a fraction of their cancer treatment budget go to reward innovators for new cancer drugs. But they get the drugs themselves at marginal cost. The thinking being that that would then incentivize them to spend more money on the treatment of cancer, the detection and things like that. And that as, as they increase their expenditures, the amount of the uh, rewards for the innovators would go up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank you all so much, and for the, my colleagues for the great questions, and you all for the great answers. And we, I just want to remind everybody that please, the, the post-hearing submissions, sometimes, I, look, it's wonderful to engage in the dialogue, but this is not, I mean, this is neither a forum to adjudicate nor a forum to debate. This is a forum to tell you the questions that are actually on our mind, to be totally transparent to you, so that you can then give us evidence that we can then write about in our report. We, we, we can't do, I, I can't write a report that says, Rohit looks like a really nice guy and he tells me something's good and therefore it's good and he told me with a stern finger that something's bad and therefore it's bad. I, the sternness of the finger can't feature in a footnote. Um, I, I need data and my colleagues need data. So we, we really, we take seriously your concern that your colleagues ask you in India about the trepidation they feel. This is a two-way street. We hope you'll let them know 
the truth, which is we're asking questions transparently. We're asking for the evidence and the data that you all will submit so that you can tell them the reality that is here that we hope will assuage their concerns, their human beings, we care about their concerns, but we also hope that we'll keep our business that we're in operating. We're, we're interested in analyzing stuff, but we need the stuff to analyze. Uh, so, so along those lines, there seems like the conversation's really turned from production, if you will, to access. So um, there are two access uh, questions to, that, that at least come to my mind to, to ask about. And, and again, I recognize that we won't be able to answer them here, uh, but, but I hope uh, we could at least share an understanding about what the question is and then figure out how we could answer it and then look forward to your answers. So, um, so one question is uh, uh, raised by an Indian American. Uh, Ananda Chakrabarty, Dr. Chakrabarty. So he uh, happened to have invent, uh, invented a, a recombinant bacterium. I think he's been pretty straightforward in telling everybody uh, he designed it at the time he was working, I think, for General Electric. He thought it would be useful in cleaning up oil spills. It, I think it turned out to have no commercial significance. But it turned out to have cultural significance. It made its way up to the Supreme Court in the United States and the Chakrabarty decision, the decision that people attribute to the biotech patenting in the United States. And setting aside questions about whether the biotech industry in the United States has suffered or thrived since then, I want to ask an access question. So I, I used to do biotech bench science. So I, I would sit and I would use these things, uh, restriction enzymes, uh, TAC polymerase, uh, reagents. My understanding is that basic biology research seems to be occurring in the United States at extraordinary rates 30 years after the biotech Chakrabarty decision. Put differently, quite an extraordinary amount of access. And it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be evidence that all of that use is commercially licensed at the catalog prices for those biotech products, which suggests that there's large numbers of what we might think of as low value uses occurring openly, and the system seems to tolerate it because the IP owners seem to tolerate it. And the case that, that, that um, I think it was Mr. Maverdoff mentioned, but although several of you have alluded to, the Myriad case, it took 30 years for a dispute about whether there was patent infringement of those basic biotech patents. It took 30 years before even one of those got to the courts. And that was a so-called declaratory judgment action, which means it was the user who said to the IP owner, if you won't sue me, I'll sue you. So I have a hard time, if you could just, those of you who are worried about access, if you could explain how the biotech use in the United States of patented stuff that has for 30 years triggered no lawsuits is an example of restricted access because it sounds from the data like it's an example of rather unrestricted access. Now the, the flip side of the coin is for those talking about compulsory licenses as a cram down, as Mr. Love suggested, it, it, it would be too convenient to say um, we're now offering large volumes at low prices if you weren't offering larger volumes at low prices before. And, and so if you could follow up in the post hearing and talk about have you in fact been offering large volume low prices? Put, put differently, in Commissioner Pinkert's question, he asked about a hypothetical where overall uh, financing, if you will, could change. 
But isn't it possible that overall financing does not change, but what changes is who participates in the conversations and what are the commercial